come with songs of joy and shouts of gratitude. Some carry heavy burdens and sighs of suffering. As you welcome us into your house, lift our burdens and receive our praise. Salt us with your grace and flavor us with your mercy. Bind us together that we may be, be at peace with one another and be strengthened to go forth in service to the world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let us together confess our sin. This is a responsive prayer of confession, and so it also has the bold and yellow, which I'll invite you to respond with. Merciful God, you call us to turn away from behaviors and attitudes that belong to the darkness, to live honest and transparent lives as children of the light. We confess the times when we have failed, giving in to our darker thoughts and desires, and acting in ways that did not bring honor to your name. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. Teach us how to live as children of the light. You call us to love one another, to put the needs and interests of those around us above our own, to love others as deeply as we have been loved by you. We confess the times when we have failed, allowing our own desires and interests to take precedence over the needs of others. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. Teach us how to love as we have been loved. You call us to deal honorably with one another, even those who have hurt or offended us, to work through our disagreements with love and integrity, and so to build up the body of Christ. We confess the times when we have failed, finding it easier to simply walk away from hurtful relationships or to talk behind people's backs rather than to their faces. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. Teach us how to live with love and integrity. Give us hunger to know you more so that we may do your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God turns our sorrow into gladness and our times of mourning into celebration. For God hears the prayer of faith. Be confident as we pray for one another. For God heals and forgives. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I invite you to turn toward your neighbor and give him a passing of peace of warm water. Peace be with you, Jim. Peace be with you, Jim. Peace be with you, You don't have to attend on a regular basis because basically 
Um, what they're talking about is what's um, talked about during Pastor Rich's message on the morning. So um, there's no pre-planning or pre-studying or anything. Just just listen to his message and go down and, and give your, your thoughts and feedback on it. Um, in regards to health updates, um, we have quite a few here. Um, Bruce Kupanke is going to be having heart surgery tomorrow. So this has been a long-awaited um, process, and there's been lots of ups and downs coming up to the state. But um, we're, we're praying for you, Bruce, and, and we'll be here to support you. Um, Mona Anderson received her first treatment for her bladder cancer um, this past week, and so she's at home. Um, Right now she's doing okay, but we, we certainly want to send Mona our well wishes. So there is a card outside the friendship room. Um, please take a moment to sign that so that um, we can get that home to her and she can feel the love of her church family here. Um, Alan Bath had his heart procedure this past week, and he's home recovering from that and doing well. Um, I got word that Val Morrison um, has had several falls. No major injuries, um, but she could use our prayers because... Falling at 105, you need extra prayers, I'm sure. So, um, prayers for Val. And certainly we want to continue prayers for Maggie as she's in hospice care, as well as for Ken French, who's still in the hospital uh, with his back issues. Uh, we want to express our sympathies to Nader Rod's family. Um, his father passed away this past week, so prayers for the whole Rod family as they mourn the loss of the head. Um, also, back in July, um, Larry, our, our organist on alternate weeks of Beverly, uh, his husband had passed away. And this Saturday um, is the memorial service for Roger. Um, that's down at Plymouth UCC in Milwaukee, and the service starts at 2 o'clock. Um, if anybody is interested in getting more information on that, um, certainly you can talk to me, um, or you can uh, check on the website. It's Roger Stevens um, at Plymouth UCC. Um, let's see, flowers on the altar today are from Sophie Landowski, in gratitude for all the seasons, especially fall, <laughs> fall flowers we have there today. Uh, a big thank you to our women's, on, our ladies ensemble for their uh, ministry of music today, both for the prelude and for ministry of music, so thank you all. And fellowship time treats are from Jim and Mona. Jim came here all on his own and got, got all the goodies out there. So a special thank you to Jim for all the, the treats that he brought. And then birthdays. Throughout the course of this week, we have Bonnie Gurner, Gaylene Forrest, Kelly Salinas, Jan Deslatic, Carrie Jo Patton, Jim Strohmeyer, and Gary McRillis. So please join me in singing. Happy birthday to you. We'd like to invite the kids to come forward for our children's message, and after that, Jack, you can read the first scripture lesson. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, guys. Well, we got five. Well, this will make for some good and healthy competition, because uh, I won't have a competition this morning, but I'm going to allow you to have some help, uh, because we are at the end of James. Uh, the book of James, five chapters. We spent three and a half months in it together. Um, you've probably been at some of the sessions, um, but you haven't been to all of them. That's probably the same for everyone that's here this morning. And so we're going to have a little quiz to see how well we have learned the book of James. But I'm not going to make you do it alone. I'm going to allow you to pick someone from the congregation to be your partner. So look that way, and you need to pick somebody to be your partner. <laughs> Double up, you can, because uh, these are some hard questions. I, I'm guessing we're going to go for parents, but I don't know. I can tell you, Jim Schleif would be a fan. Like, if you want to win, uh, there is a pastor with a seminary degree on the front row, uh, or at least one of the front rows, but I need you to pick very quickly. <laughs> but you can't all pick Jim. Jim, you're going to. Alright, so he has got Jim. Rowan, you're going to pick? Miss Jenny. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's a good pick. Okay, Burton's going to take Jenny. Yeah. Who are you going to take, Rowan? And Rowan and Evan, you can double up. Who do you guys want to take? You two. Mom. Mom? Okay, Elise. I'm taking Jennifer. Jennifer? Who's, which, who's, which Jennifer? <gasps> well, Evan wants you, Jennifer. All right, and then Hazel? Daddy, all right. So Mitch, Jennifer, Elise, uh, Jim. And Jenny. 
and Jenny. Okay, so come up. Let's space out here so you're by your partner because I got to see who raises their hand first. Okay. Congregation, you can play along because there is a point to this. This isn't just to do a little quiz. Evan, you're going to go with Jen? Stand beside Jennifer. Okay, so if you know the answer, kids, or if you, um, allies, know the answer, raise your hand and I'm look for the first raised answer. Sophie, you're unofficially taking, um, oh keeping track. There's a pen in the back of my server that you, you can maybe keep notes on if you'd like. Okay, here's the first question. You ready? The first ones are pretty easy, uh, but they're easy for a reason. Because James has some greatest hits, and then he has... Some not so greatest hits, which is chapter five. We're looking at there's no verses we go to in chapter five, which is what makes it hard. But we all know some of these. But be blank of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Doers. Doers. Okay. All right. Just it up. So Burton, Burton has the first. Be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Faith by itself, if it has those works, is blank. Elise was up first and dead. is dead or useless or ineffective or worthless. James calls them all those things, but there he says dead. You ready? According to James, what is the royal law? Jenny, you said that looks really hesitant. Wait, is that the one we talked about last time? I'm giving no hints. <laughs> is the royal law like. Like if, not, if you remember, I'm about to buzz. I'm about to uh, buzz. Let's yes, yes, no, we don't. No. <laughs> oh, this is an important one. This is like one of James' greatest hits. He has a royal law. James loves the whole law, but there's one law that he encapsulates every line, and Jesus does as well. Jesus is asked, "What's the greatest commandment?" And he gives two. That's a great one, but that's not James' royal law. It's pretty close. Okay, it's not that, and I heard it. <laughs> because that's another question. That's a, like, save that answer, because you may be able to use that. Nobody knows, the, anyone in the congregation know the royal law, according to James. Royal meaning, it's the law of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is a political thing. He is king. He is Lord. And his law is love your neighbor as yourself. That obscure place in Leviticus. And James actually says the royal law. No, the love one another. Uh, and it's not quite. I can't give it. Can't give it. These are Jeopardy rules. It has to be a exact answer. All right? So we go. Two points. Dividing among the couple. Let everyone be quick to blank, slow to blank, slow to anger. You got an Evie? Be quick to what? Okay, Evie's got it. Jim and Evie got it over here. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. These are still James' biggest hits. Um, here we get a little bit more obscure. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for blank and blank in their distress and to keep oneself blank by the world. This is a tough one. I need three answers. To care for blank and blank and to keep oneself blank from the world. They don't have to answer. You can answer on his behalf. You're his ally. Okay. And to keep oneself... I'll take that. It's unspotted or unstained. Okay, so this is an important passage because for James, this is what religion's about. This is why we gather this morning. That we might care for people who are needy, the orphans and widows, particularly in his community, uh, and to keep oneself unspotted by the world. So there's a twofold call. Jimmy's got that. You guys are up two to one. All right. My brothers, and this immediately follows that passage. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ while showing, and this is important because he's just said, be unspotted by the world. So don't claim that you have this religion, faith, and show blank. Partiality. You got it. All right. It's two to two right here. You guys got to catch up. You got to catch up. There's only a few more questions. But no one can tame the blank. A restless eagle. You got it. James Burton got it. The Tom. James is very concerned about how we use our speech. And that will come up in today's passage as well. These conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your blank that are at war within you? 
Okay, boy, we got, what is the score here? At least it's got, okay, desires or cravings. They come from your own desires, your own cravings. Earlier, James says, if you're tempted, don't blame God. It's your own problem. It's our desires that are in conflict with God's will oftentimes. Okay, we're coming down to the last couple. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. So who then are you to blank your neighbor? Judge. All right. Judge. Who are you to judge your neighbor? So again, James doesn't want to excuse our language in a way that harms others or brings them down. This is from last week. Above all, brothers and sisters, do not know. No. You three. They, they've discounted themselves. This is from last week. This is James kind of climax. No? Boy, I'm feeling bad that none of, none of this is landing. Oh, no, it's all right. It's not just, you know, I don't ever expect anyone to remember any sermon other than hoping it feeds you that day. But above all, brothers and sisters, do not swear. And it doesn't mean cuss. But take oaths because our yes should be yes and our no should be no. So it's three to two here? No, or three to four. four. Okay, so this is the bonus question. This is worth ten points. So this, this if you can get this one, I know that's how Jeopardy works. You come to the end, and no matter how well you've done, the last question is everything. James gives three examples, and this is from last week, chapter five for patience. What are they? Three examples of patience. And they're all kind of people. You might, if you have one of them, I'll give you three points. Any one congregation? Farmers. Farmers, one of them. That's out. No, but Jesus is always a great answer to any question. I like that answer. Like we could say Jesus all the time, and I'd be fine with that answer. But that's not the answer to this one. Although Jesus would be an example of patience, James doesn't use it. He also uses the Lord. the who? The Lord. The Lord. Okay, that's another great. That's another great answer. He uses um, prophets who endured suffering, and finally, he uses good old Job. Oh. Yeah. All right. So right now, who's in the lead? James Scripps in the lead. Um, and this is just a bonus question because I think it's interesting if we go back to James' greatest hit, which is not only faith without works is dead, but be doers of the word and not merely hearers. He has one final one I'll toss out there. This is worth five points. Those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blank in their doing. <laughs> Jesus, but 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 Jen said bless. Bless. So that means you got five points. You just won. You just won. You have five points? Okay, it's a tie. And I was going to start this whole thing by saying you're going to receive a blessing if you win, and then say, there's your blessing. Which you really, the blessing of James is never just merely hearing. It's always actually living this out. That, that if we hear these things and don't do, we, we're not going to be blessed. And Jesus says the same things. Blessed are you when you do that. But I do want to give you a reward because I do think that it's important to feel like you've accomplished something. And so let me give you a, give you and your allies. Now, this wasn't an, I don't have a twigs. This wasn't an exercise just to pass some time. This was an exercise in order to remind us all of James' greatest hits and what he's already told us so that we can think about how do we live it because James is going to end with this big call to not only hear but to do. And so we'll look at that in today's. Thank you for being such a good group of participants. You guys did really well. Everyone did really well. It's hard to remember all this stuff. I'm in it every day, every week. So it's, you know, I'm supposed to know this stuff. I get paid to know this stuff. And I want to know this stuff. I want us all to live this stuff more than anything. So let me pray with you before I send you back to your seats. Thank you, God, for your word that guides and leads, that teaches us the way of Jesus, that invites us to respond in a way that gives us blessing and gives us life. Help us to be a blessing to others as we seek to walk in your way. 
Thank you for each person up here and each person in this room. May we be blessed as we hear your word and may we know that blessing by living in your way. In the name of Christ, we pray this together. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Hey, we've been to <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord from James 5, verses 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? You should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Here ends the first reading. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's beautiful. It really goes with our passage. If anyone is uh, suffering, let them pray. If anyone is cheerful, let them praise. James is constantly alluding to Jesus, particularly his Sermon on the Mount, with about 26 or so allusions to the Sermon on the Mount. But he certainly was influenced by Jesus' life and parables, and it could be when he's speaking about wandering from faith, he is referring to this parable that Jesus tells about the way of God for those who wander. So I invite you to stand, if you're able, for this reading from the Gospel. We'll follow this up with hymn number 580, My Life Flows On, hymn number 580. Our Lord says in Matthew 18, Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, in heaven their angels can continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's not one of those faith without works are dead or be quick to listen, slow to anger, uh, or be hearers of the word and not doers, or the tongue is set on fire by hell. None of the greatest hits of James find their origin in James chapter 5. So there's a sense in which the series finale, by many reviewers and critics, is a letdown. It is a slow fizzle. It's a burn that just doesn't give us any kind of climax. 
You did notice when Jackie read it, it ends just abruptly, just like The Sopranos. You know, it's all of a sudden this shows over the screen, goes black, no credits, it's just done, and you wonder, what's going on here? What happened? How does that connect to this whole show? James is like that. He doesn't, like every other letter in the New Testament, talk about his recipients and greet them or say a word of encouragement to that particular church. Uh, this is a general letter written to the general church, but there's a sense in which he just doesn't conclude it. If you uh, see someone wandering from their faith, seek them out, uh, because love covers a multitude of sins. End of story, screen goes blank, the series is over. And we're left thinking, was that a slow fizzle? Did James just not know how to land the plane? What's going on here? Why does it end so anticlimactically? And I think there is a sense in which James does end anticlimactically. However, it's not because he hasn't revisited what he began in the first place. If we pay close attention to what James has to say at the end, everything he says at the end is just a practical way to live out what he said in the beginning. Last week we looked at the first half of chapter 5 and we noticed that James is attaching the themes that began in chapter 1, verse 1. Consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials. You need to endure so that you'll grow in wisdom and you'll have a mature faith. And right from the beginning, he talks about enduring faith in trying times. He wants them to endure faithfully. And then he tells about that trying time, that there are those who are unjustly treating them. There are laborers that are working out in the field that aren't being paid, and the wealthy are taking advantage of that and taking them to court and not paying them. And they're, they're living in this unjust world, and they need to respond not with violence or not aggressively, but they need to respond with patient endurance, like the farmer, like the prophet, like Job. That's what we looked at last week in chapter 5, which has none of the greatest hits. This week, James concludes by saying not only faithfully, but because we're needy people, we need to be prayerfully relying on God's good gifts all the way to the end. Because for James, there's one thing he knows for sure about God. God gives all good gifts generously to those who seek them. That the Father of lights is one in whom there's no shifting shadows or no subject to change. And that God is consistently good all the time and that God hears prayers and will respond to prayers because God cares for the world and particularly God cares for God's people. And so he now talks about enduring faithfully by praying and what you find at the beginning here is he essentially says you need to be praying in all seasons, whether you're suffering, whether you're cheerful, whether you're sick, that prayer is the just default attitude of the person who understands that God gives generously every good gift. So if you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, praise, which is just a way of speaking, you know, joyous thoughts to God. And if you're particularly sick and you can't make it into the community, call for those in the community to make sure that you're all aware of that person's needs and that they are prayed for, particularly in James' case, by leaders of the church. This is James' way of saying what Paul says when Paul says, pray at all times. But James is practical. And he doesn't just say pray at all times. He says pray in all circumstances. In every practical circumstance you face, from joy to sorrow, from sickness to health, be a person that prays. And then he gives this, and I think many of these last verses have some very challenging parts that I don't know if James is particularly addressing that community or what we do with it. I honestly, there are times I come across passages and I'm not sure what to do with them. This one in particular, anyone who's sick, obviously these people are sick to the point where they can't come to the community, so they should call for the elders of the church. The onus is on them to make sure that the elders are aware of them, have them pray over them, anointing them with oil, which is one of the practices of ancient times. That oil not only had a ritual component, but at times it had a healing component. It was a way to medicinally try to treat somebody. And the elders will come and pray, and the passage I have the most challenge with is the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. Because we all know this, uh, you will have one final sickness, and you won't be able to pray your way out of it, and no one will be able to pray your way out of it. Uh, there's a certain prosperity gospel that says, you know, if we pray in faith, God will always heal. James comes very close to saying something like that, but I think he's actually going a little bit further and not just reducing prayer to this kind of pull the, pull the arm and you're automatically healed. I think he is saying prayer faith will save the sick and the Lord will 
raise them up, and he's using a phrase that basically means resurrection. And so in our final sickness, when we're praying for someone who has been given a diagnosis that is tragic and, and, and that won't, they won't recover from, there is a sense in which you are still praying in hope before, because of the resurrection of the dead. Because you have this hope of an afterlife. You have a hope that God loves all that God has created. And all that God loves will be kept by God and none will be lost. And so I think that's sort of going on. But then you have this unusual phrase, if they've committed sins, they'll be forgiven. Which sort of gives the hint that maybe they're causing their own sickness. I, I don't know. I really don't know what to make of this. Other than whatever season in life you're in. Sorrowful, cheerful, sick, sick unto death that there is this call to pray. Because prayer is the way we endure in faith. And that prayer involves praying for one another and confessing our sins to one another so that part of that healing might be the restoration and reconciliation of broken relationships, confessing your sins to one another. But the beautiful part of this, which all of these wonderful phrases get obscured by challenging context, Martin Luther, if you remember, called James the Epistle of Straw. He thought it ought to be burned. He didn't want it included in the canon. And the reason is, it says we're not justified by faith alone, but works have an important role. And for Luther, his key bumper sticker slogan was by faith alone. And James says we're not justified by faith alone. So Luther hated this epistle. He did love this verse. He found this verse to be the most cherishable verse in it, and you can see why for Luther. Well, it doesn't get all messed up in the theology of things and the theology of salvation, but it does encourage not just the elders and leaders in the church to pray for those in the church, but it encourages all of us to pray for one another. And Luther found that to be very, very important, as does James, as do I, that I'm not the only person that can pray. Leaders aren't the only one that can pray. Elders aren't the only ones that can pray over you. That we're to pray for one another and to confess to one another and to seek to lift up one another with our words. And by suggesting this, what James is doing is he's essentially taking us to a place where we realize in chapter 3 he says our tongues are set on fire by hell. You can't control your tongue. With it we bless the Lord and with it we curse people made in the image of God. We have this uncontrollable thing. But what he's trying to do is to direct our tongue in a righteous direction. So we speak words of blessing. And we speak words of lifting others up. Of prayer. Of making sure that we're looking at the needs and the challenges that others have. And instead of judging or grumbling or cursing that we are using this gift of speech that God has given us in a way that builds up and lifts up others. He does all of this by then doing what he's done already. He gives you an example. And again, I feel James confuses us with the example because we focus on the really incredible part and miss the point. The prayer of the righteous is, is powerful and effective. Now he's going to use Elijah. Elijah's a rock star. You all ought to know that. Uh, Moses, Elijah, and David, the three rock stars of the Old Testament. Moses because he gave the law, David because he was king, Elijah because he was the great prophet. He actually raises the dead in his ministry. He, he fights the priest of Baal. Uh, he is this incredible, incredible, miraculous, miracle-working prophet. And so when he includes Elijah, I think, oh no, don't, don't use him as your model. Because Elijah's a rock star. And then he says, he points attention to Elijah's, one of his greatest things where he prays and there's no rain for three year, years and six months. He prays again and the earth gives rain and we think, well, I can't do that. And, and I, I don't think you can. I don't think I can either. But that's not James' point, but it, it's hidden in the details because do you see what his point is? Pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another. No matter what season of life you're in. Do that because... You can be like Elijah, and you need to realize that your prayer is powerful and effective, and you, like Elijah, are just a normal human. You're just another human being, just like all of our celebrities are, just like all those we look up to. They're just people that put their pant legs on one leg at a time, just like we do. Elijah, if you read his full story, he's depressed, he's anxious. He feels like the Lord has abandoned him. He takes on 400 prophets of Baal and then runs from um, a queen that's ready to take him out. And he becomes depressed and he feels like he needs to die and he's very suicidal. It, it, it's very interesting to see Elijah is just like us. He has all the ups and downs we do. 
And that's why James uses him, not because of his extraordinary feat, but because he's human like us. And he wants us to realize that we can live in the way of the people of God in the past by sticking to our guns, enduring in hard times, in sorrow, in joy, and making sure we pray for one another and with one another. All of that then is concluded by James saying, not only should we pray for one another, but we should be concerned for one another. Concerned for those who wander. My brothers and sisters, if anyone wanders from the truth and is brought back, you should know that you're bringing them from wandering and they will be saved. And the love and grace and forgiveness of God will cover a multitude of sins. And there, in that final word, he's quoting a proverb as James has throughout this, path, this book. He quotes Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. He quotes the prophets. He quotes the law. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and then he quotes the Proverbs again and again. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of transgressions. And the emphasis in drawing the wandering is not to condemn or to judge. The emphasis is to show this overwhelming, extravagant forgiveness and desire to be in community together. Now, I don't know, again, what we do with something like this, because we all know we live in a world where not all who wander are lost. Uh, some take summers off. Some uh, attend once every three months. Uh, I'm not the church police. I don't control. I don't even think James is talking about church attendance here. He, in his community, would know if people were there because basically in his time, there was one church in every town that had a church. And if you weren't there, you weren't hearing the word of God. You weren't praying together with the community. You weren't participating in the life of the church. We all know you can just, in spitting distance, hit three or four other churches from our church. And so, you know, if someone's not here, perhaps they're there. And if they're not there, perhaps they're on vacation. And if they're not on vacation, perhaps they're sick. They need to call us. If, they, if they're not sick, then perhaps, you know, they've chosen that this is the attendance and the way I'm going to approach community life. None of it's bad. None of it's good. It does challenge, though, what do we do as far as seeking people out? And I don't have an answer for it other than to know that it's not my job. It's our job. It's all of us. We're all called to care for our brothers and sisters and to see who's participating and who's not. And if they're not, is there good reason that they're not? And if they, uh, if there's no good reason, are we saying, you know, we miss you or we'd like to see you present? Or are we asking about where they're at in their faith and whether they perhaps had a wrong turn or a bad turn or have been challenged or been hurt by the community? Who knows? But it seems like James is like Jesus saying that when someone wanders, know that they're not lost, but they are out there and they are someone that we as a community are meant to prayerfully in endurance, seek out, and to love. I think James knows that the faith is never meant to be lived alone. Uh, you can just go back to Genesis chapter 2 to realize God's plan for us is never that we be alone. It is not good for the man to be alone, which is not just about marriage. It is that God has made us social beings. And when you look at Jesus' mission statement, I've come to build the church. He never came just to save individuals. He came to build a community that was redemptive and that was living out the dream of God's kingdom and that shared faith together and shared service together and shared life together so that none of us are meant to thrive or grow wise or endure on our own. We need others to lean on. We need others uh, to help along the way. And that's how James ends. Do you see it? It's stark. Screen goes blank. Credits roll. It's over. No greeting. Nothing else. And again, that's why so many people, they don't even cover chapter 5. I wouldn't do it unless I felt compelled to conclude this book. But I think once you see the themes that have arisen of endurance and of prayerfully caring for one another and of speaking words of truth, and of seeking a community that is whole and redemptive, you can begin to see that what James is doing is he's showing us there's no shortcut to maturity. That from the opening chapter to the end, his big, big thing is endure. Faith without works is dead. Don't be mere hearers, but be doers. Consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials. Endure those in faith, seeking out God. And when you realize he's spoken of patience seven times in chapter 5 and of prayer seven times, those are his big things, and those two things are what makes us spiritually mature. There's no instant solution. 
There's no instant spirituality. There is only instead enduring life together in faith as a community, prayerfully seeking the God who generously gives all gifts, seeking to live together in such a way that we as a community reflect the kingdom of God in this unjust world and this harsh world that we live in. So when you see how James is concluded, I would like to suggest he doesn't fizzle out. He just expands on what he started at the beginning when he speaks about faith produces endurance. And the only way endurance completes itself is stick to it, this, this, uh, it is remaining committed, standing strong, being there over the long haul of times of sorrow and times of cheer and times of sickness in times of wandering. The only way that faith endures is if it is living in a way that there is this steadfast commitment. And he says, that's the only thing that will make you complete and whole, lacking in nothing. But know this, that endurance is not of yourself. You don't have that strength on your own. You are needy. I am needy. And so we not only are enduring, but we are praying. If any of you is lacking in wisdom in the opening verses, he says, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. Do you see how James has just woven his way back to the beginning? He's just expanded that beginning, and he shows us in chapter 5 what that looks like in some of the particulars of life, because James is ruthlessly practical. Because for James, I think this is his big deal. I think this may be the most important verse in the entire book. In that same chapter 1, he does not want our religion to be worthless. He doesn't want our faith to be dead and useless. He realizes that that's a real possibility. In fact, he calls it a deception. That, that there is this, this ability to deceive ourselves and think that we're doing just fine when we're not doing just fine. And there's a way to perceive ourselves as religious and spiritual that really isn't religious and spiritual at all. Which is why he says, if you think you're religious, if it's all in your head, but you don't bridle your tongues, you don't control your behavior, you don't control your words, you're deceiving your heart, your religion is worthless. Because pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. It's not only bridling tongues, using your words in healing ways, in prayer and concern for others. It's caring for those who are needy and marginalized. And it's keeping oneself unspotted by the world. Rejecting partiality, rejecting strife and envy and pride, which he calls the wisdom from below, and living in humility and mercy and patience, which he calls the wisdom from above. For him, the royal law is that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, and mercy triumphs over judgment. That at the end of the day, God is a God who gives generously and ungrudgingly to all those who ask and seek. So I find, as we come to the close of James, a very practical book. It's all about endurance. He wants us to endure faithfully in trying times, prayerfully relying on God's good gifts, enduring honestly with words that build up, and enduring harmoniously as a community of peace, because James is all about action. That's why he's so indebted to the Sermon on the Mount. 26 times he alludes to the Sermon on the Mount. Do you know the Sermon on the Mount is not so much about what you believe, is about you, how you behave. Love your enemies. Pray for those. Uh, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Don't speak evil against your neighbor. Don't call them a fool. Uh, do not judge one another. All these practical behaviors that Jesus speaks about in the Sermon on the Mount, James is also concerned about because at the end of the day, he knows our deception is we look in the mirror and we say, I'm just fine. Uh, I'm just fine. You know why I'm just fine? Because of what I believe. I believe God is one. Uh, I believe in Jesus. And so I'm just fine. And the mirror looks back at you and says, but what are you doing? How are your hands acting? You know, creeds deal with belief. What do we believe? Ethics and practices about how we behave. And James' big emphasis is how do we behave? Faith without works is dead. Hearing without doing is deceptive. And so James says, look in the mirror, not in your head. Look in the mirror and see how you're behaving. See how you're using your mouth. See how you're using your hands. See how you're acting or not acting in community. Look and see what you're doing because it's not about what you have in your head. It's about how you live out your faith 
in this life. Look and see and be a hearer. And not don't be just a hearer, but be a doer. Because James' greatest hit is one big, big thing. His faith without works is useless, dead, and effective. He wants us to adore. He wants us to stand strong in that. James knows we can't change the world. The world's unjust, and it's going to rail against the ways of Jesus. But he knows that if we strive and endure prayerfully and honestly together as a caring community, we can change our world, and we can change the way we respond and the way we behave. And it's all a matter of not just having facts in the head, but having God's word burning in our heart, which is when James speaks, and this is the last slide I have, if he believes anything about God, it's this. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every generous act of good, every perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights. There's no variation or shadow due to change. God is consistently good like this with perfect gifts streaming from above. So live from above instead of from below. Because what God is trying to do is giving birth to us through the word of truth so that we would be the first fruits, the first representation of what it means to live Jesus' way of life, to live the kingdom way of life, to endure in faith and to practice in such a way that we live life under a generous God, seeking to bless the world rather than curse it, seeking to live in harmony rather than in strife and division, seeking to leave the wisdom from above rather than to live according to the wisdom from below. I'll give just a moment to reflect and then we'll have a prayer response to this. So if you respond with what's bold and yellow, God, our healer, your will for all people is health and salvation. We praise you and thank you, O Lord. Holy Spirit, you make our bodies the temple of your presence. We praise and thank you, O Lord. We pray for 
Larry, as he deals with the loss of his partner, be present with him, particularly at this memorial service. We pray for Nader, who's lost his father. We pray for Val and for Alan as he recovers. We pray for Mona. We pray for Bruce. Then there are other names, people close to our hearts. We lift them and ask, oh God, may your strength, your peace, your grace, uh, your presence and love be present in their lives. Teach us how we may best uh, reflect that to them. Finally, we thank you for the gifts given in the giving church and pray to bless both the gift and the giver. As together we pray boldly with all the saints which you, our risen Lord, have taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. For our final song, we're going to revisit uh, Carolyn Winfrey Gillette has put together some marvelous verses that basically, in, in rhyming form, reflect some of the teachings of James. And so for the last time since we're done with this series, we're going to sing together. The words will be on the screen. It's to the tune of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And Hopefully we can all gel with that. So I want to invite you to stand, if you're able, for this final song as we sing together, O Lord, May All We Say and Do. Amen.